so much. Thank you. You know, it's a real privilege and honor, Joni and Marcus, for you to have Rivers and I here, and, and especially uh, to be able to share with you. I mean, I, as we said earlier, you know, it was a, quite a paradigm shift for me to go from being a traditional Lutheran pastor to a, to a Lutheran pastor with a, with a ministry that moves in, in God's signs, wonders, and miracles. And, and once I realized that people were flocking to Jesus, not with sermon notebooks, but they were bringing the lame, the blind, you know, the demon-possessed, people that really needed a touch from God. And I kept thinking, why doesn't the church do this? Why doesn't the church restore this? It, you know, the Bible says if you believe in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, right? No one confesses Christ as Lord without the Holy Spirit. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. But what I realized, that's the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. We, we have the power of God in us already to raise the dead. We just don't know how to appropriate it. And no one taught me that through all my seminary experience and in my Navy uh, career. I, I never learned that. But once God revealed it to me, then I saw something that I, I wanted to share with other people. I wanted to uh, share the power of Jesus. And so in, in our church, you know, we, we have a preaching, teaching ministry, but, but it, the capstone is healing and deliverance because people want to be restored. People are broken in their minds. Do you know people that have anxiety in their lives or, dis, or depression or, or people that are struggling with uh, fear? You know, that's not of God. But that's a stronghold that can get hold of even believers and torment them. Or people with broken hearts, you know, that trust has been violated. And so that trust needs to be restored. It's, I think it's easier to pray for a broken leg than a broken heart. Because trust is so precious to us. Or there's broken relationships, marriages, or, or relationships with children or grandparents or colleagues at work or classmates. And those, those can be restored as well. There's the, the, uh, the obvious physical healing, uh, which needs to take place. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But there's also that most important healing, uh, that spiritual healing. You know, we, we all know the wages of sin is death, right? We're all going to die. There's a common denominator in this room right now. It's death. We're going to all die. But, but the gift that God gives us is eternal life. And those two boys in China that we baptized in that frozen lake, they're in heaven. They're sealed in heaven. They may not be there yet, but they're going to be there. And they're going to be able to tell other people about that great gift that God has for them. But there's a passage I want to read from, from the Gospel of Mark because I think it's of profound importance for us. In Mark chapter 6, 53, it says, When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. And as soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. You know, people ought to be able to recognize Jesus in his church today. It's his church. We call it the body of what? The body of Christ. And if it's the body of Christ, he ought to be recognized there. And how do you recognize Jesus? By his preaching and, and teaching and healing. So they recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and gathered the sick. They gathered the sick on mats uh, to, uh, to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, in the villages, in the towns, the countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplace. You know, they don't take the sick to the synagogue. I think this really speaks to marketplace ministry. You know, if you want to touch the lives of people, you need to reach them where they're at. Where are the people today? They're out there in the malls and the, and the, and the movies and, and the sports arenas. I mean, that's where, the, that's where the world is that needs to be reached. You know, and we need to have a marketplace ministry, not just sharing the word, but letting the power of God be demonstrated in the lives of people because that will draw people to the God of healing. It'll shake their world. That, that's what I find in my experience. When people get touched uh, in a profound way, uh, it shakes their world. It says, they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his coat, and all who touched him were healed. I, I love that. All they had to do was reach out and touch the hem of the garment of the master, and they got it, all of them. You know, where's the hem of the master today? Is it in heaven? I don't think so. I think it's right here in this room. You know, Jesus is present right here in this room. His garment is here. All we have to do is reach out and touch it. And, and, and I wrote this book because I wanted people to understand how Jesus healed, who he healed, when he healed, why he healed, who wasn't healed, what do you do when Jesus doesn't heal. I wanted it to be a manual to help people understand the reality of Jesus, who's never changed. The church has changed, but we, we, we've kind of moved away from him, but he hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday and today. And so the hem of the garment is here today. All we have to do is reach out and, and touch it. Sometimes it's by faith. 
You know, sometimes people are healed because they believe. And sometimes it's because of strong faith, like the centurion. Sometimes it's because of a weak faith, like the father in Mark 9. I believe Jesus, but help what? My, my unbelief. But I've seen people heal with no faith. And even after they were healed, it didn't come to Christ. But their healing witnessed to other people. But sometimes God healed because of his compassion. Sometimes he healed to glorify himself. The blind man in John chapter 9, remember the disciples said, why is he blind? Something he did or something his parents did. That's sort of that religious, legalistic, judgmental spirit. Jesus said, shut up. He's healed because the Son of God needs to be glorified right now. Sometimes it's to glorify God. You know, I, what happens when people aren't healed? Do you ever ask yourself that question? I've, had, I've, I've asked myself many times. I pray for a lot of people that are healed. I pray for a lot of people that aren't healed. First of all, if I don't pray for the sick, nobody will get healed. The, the church doesn't pray, nobody will get healed. We all need to be doing it. But what happens when people aren't healed? Every Sunday I preach the gospel. Not everybody's saved. In fact, sometimes I preach the gospel and nobody's saved. But do I quit preaching because people aren't saved? That would be ludicrous. What kind of ministry would that be? So when I pray for the sick, is everybody healed? And no. But do I quit praying for the sick? Absolutely not. I keep going. Because God is good, God knows what he's doing, and I have to trust him. If you're healed and this person's not, God knows what he's doing. Sometimes he's working through issues in our lives. You know, sometimes people have spiritual plaque in their bodies that kind of block the flow of healing. Let me give you an example. Do you know anybody that struggles with unforgiveness? Unforgiveness puts in place a, a root of bitterness. And that bitterness begins to eat away in a person, that, that unforgiveness. And then it turns into resentment. They begin to resent the person, and then they start to get angry. And then they want to get even. They want to retaliate. And it turns into hatred and it becomes violent, even unto death sometimes. All right? Forgiveness. Jesus spends a lot of time talking about the importance to forgive. The Lord's Prayer, Father, forgive us as to, to the extent that we're able to forgive others. Forgiveness is of paramount importance to, to let go of the past so we can move on into the future. If we're hung up on the past and un, unable to forgive, it's going to bog us down. Think of Lot's wife. She looked back trying to remember the past, and she gets immobilized, doesn't she? She becomes a pillar of salt. Does God want us to live in that state? No. He wants us to turn and move forward. All right? And forgiveness can uncouple us from the past. Now, let me give you the connection between unforgiveness and physical ailment. Sometimes people can't forgive themselves. They resent themselves. They don't like themselves. They want to retaliate against themselves. They get angry at themselves. They get violent. You know, what is anorexic behavior? It's nothing more than a person that doesn't like themselves trying to starve the person inside them. That's what anorexia is. It's a person that doesn't like themselves. They don't love themselves. They, they reject themselves. They can't forgive themselves for whatever reason. All right? If you don't like yourself, your body has an, a beautiful gift from God. It's called our immune system. It can protect us from anything external, but you know what? It cannot protect us against ourselves. It can protect you against attacks from the outside, but think about it. If you don't like yourself, if you resent yourself, if you wish yourself were dead, your body says, okay, I will accommodate you. And you know what happens? Cancer is nothing more than your cells attacking your own cells. That's all cancer is. It's not an invasion from some external force outside, but cancer is your body attacking itself. And if you don't like yourself, if you hate yourself, if you wish you were dead, your body may accommodate you. So what's the antidote? The antidote is forgiveness. Forgive yourself. And I can, I can share with you several examples of people that have come into our church with cancer, fourth stage cancer, some with only three weeks to live and dealt with forgiveness in their life and gone back to the doc doctor with no cancer in their bodies whatsoever. Yes. Because it's a spiritual root that gets severed. I'll give you a very common illustration. Normally people get ulcers because of what? Stress. So I could pray for your ulcer all day long, but if we don't deal with the spiritual root of stress and anxiety and fretting and worry that torments you day and night, you can't sleep, you're restless and all that, your ulcer's not going to get better. But if we lift that stress off, give that spirit of stress to God, he takes it away and replaces it with peace, sometimes, sometimes a byproduct is a healing for the ulcer. You see, there's a spiritual root oftentimes that has to be addressed. Now, sometimes God just heals because he's going to make a statement. You know, and I was in China in some of those pictures. I mean, 
power of God was moving in such a tremendous force that, and people were being healed. But, but God, it, it, people were coming to Christ through those miracles. But oftentimes we have the privilege of being able to minister to people and help them deal with the spiritual root and get relieved. You know, fear is not of God. How many of you know that? Fear is not of God. Do you know anybody that lives in fear? Of course you do. Fibromyalgia, the doctors will tell you, is fear-based, okay? Fear-based, but they don't have a cure for it. But let me explain how it works. You and I all have a fight-flight syndrome in our makeup. We see a snake, we all jump. We don't think about, oh, I need to jump, there's a snake. Our mind kicks in the, uh, the chemicals that release the muscles, the impulse, and we just jump about 30 feet. Then we look over and the snake goes away, we calm down and life goes on. People living with fear are in a constant state of secreting those enzymes, those chemicals that cause the muscles to pulsate, but there's nothing to react to, so all they're doing, they're stuck with the pulsating muscles, the pain in, in, in their extremities. It doesn't go away. The, the only way to get rid of it is understand the opposite of fear is love. Why do I say that? Perfect love casts out fear, all right? God is love. God, from Romans 5, 5, from God's throne in heaven by the Holy Spirit, he pours out his love into our hearts, fills us, flushes us, every cell, and fear can't stay where the love of God is present. So we pray for people to be delivered from fear and let the love of God fill them. And sometimes, not always, fibromyalgia is healed. You know, there's an antidote to everything. Despair, hope. Doubt, faith. Sadness, joy. Patience, impatience, all right? You can replace every bad thing with a good thing from heaven. And sometimes, and I have to emphasize sometimes, we have to deal with the spiritual roots because the physical condition is tied to that. So there is a struggle. You know, sometimes people aren't healed because they haven't dealt with the spiritual plaque in their life. I don't have the answers. I, 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 honestly, I don't know why God doesn't heal everybody. If you gave me a vote, everybody on the planet would be healed. But what he has told me is, look, Tesky, you got to trust me. you got to know that I know what I'm doing, and you have to believe that I'm, that I'm good. And, and I do that. You know, I, I don't know why everybody's not healed, but I know God is awesome. My job is simply to pray for the sick. You know, remember Moses? He comes to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's closing in from behind him. Mountains on both sides, water in front. People want to kill him. He goes to God. He says, Lord, what am I going to do? And the Lord says, Moses, why are you coming to me? He says, why am I coming to you? I got no allies here. God says, what do you, got? What do you have in your hand? He says, a stick. He says, well, use it. Okay, thank you. Water parts, right? My job is to be obedient to the word. What's the word saying? If anyone comes, anoint them with oil, lay hands on them, and pray for healing. And the prayer offered in faith. It's more about my faith praying for you than you receiving it through your faith. My job is pretty simple. God's got the hard part. I can't heal anybody. Jesus is the healer. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that heals. All I can do is be obedient to God's word and pray for, for people. So it's my hope that any of you struggling with anything would, would do an inventory. Go into yourself and say, Lord, what is it in my life that I need to confess? Is there fear? Is there anxiety? Is there any stress in my life? You know, that's not of God. Jesus says, don't be anxious. If he says, don't be anxious, then it must not be godly. I can't think of a time when, when, when an angel or God showed up and said, be afraid. Fear is not of God. You know, despair. If something will kill a, a ministry, it's despair. If it kill a marriage. It's a, it's a lack of trust. Those can be restored by the power of God. There's nothing our God can't do. People ask me all the time, can God heal cancer? Can God heal, heal Parkinson's? I got a phone call last week on my, at my church phone about a man that said, I was there about two months ago, and I don't even remember him. Uh, he said, you, you, I came to you and I said, I have Parkinson's disease. Can God, can God heal me? And I said, um, God can heal anything. So he said, you prayed for me, and I just want to report, I went to my doctor, and there's no Parkinson's. Somebody said to me, have you checked him out? <laughs> I said, no, I haven't checked it out. I mean, you know, if, if he's telling a lie, so what? I mean, but I don't believe he was. Can I, let me tell you, you know what Tourette's syndrome is? Yes. I'm going to tell you a quick story. 
A woman here in Dallas asked me if we'd ever prayed for Tourette's. And I said, no. She said, can God heal it? And I said, well, absolutely. So she said, would you pray for my nephew? And I said, where is he? In Little Rock. I said, all right. So we flew to Little Rock, met with this young man, 18-year-old man, single child, never uh, been to a public restaurant, church service, malls, movies, anywhere. Couldn't go anywhere because they have these incredible tics, these outbursts. And sometimes their profanity and vulgarity just spews out. So here's a single child in a home. Parents are both in the medical profession. So I'm sitting there looking at this kid, and I'm thinking in the natural, in the flesh, what am I doing here? I'm thinking, you know, I'd rather be somewhere else because this kid is just going through all this stuff. Let me tell you, Rivers and I prayed with him. First, we asked him uh, if, we, if he believed God could heal him. He said, I, I think so. I said, do you want him to? He said, yes. But he said, I've kind of given up. I said, okay. So we prayed the sinner's prayer. I said, why don't you just invite Jesus into your life? And he did that. 45 minutes later, all the ticks were gone. All the ticks were gone. Wow.